Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Feroz Manji from Daraja Press. Welcome to Organizing in the Time of COVID. Today, I have a, a good friend and a very interesting person, uh, David Austin, who is uh, one of the most important black writers and intellectuals in North America. Based in Montreal, David has been a prolific writer. He has published widely, uh, including, um, and I hope I can show you, uh, some of his more recent books, um, The Fear of a Black Nation, Dread Poetry and Freedom, uh, Linton Quesi Johnson, The Unfinished uh, Revolution. Um, and he has... Uh, also published books on moving against the system, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers and Making of Global Consciousness, Dread Poetry and Freedom, as I mentioned. And he's authored many, many articles on, on Caribbean and African thought, social movements, the left, and so on, as well as producing documentaries, especially uh, well known for the documentary on CLR James, uh, the Black Jacob Jacobins, and on Franz Fanon. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to have you on the show, David. Uh, well, oh, it's my my pleasure. That's uh, great. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Great to yeah. great to have you here, uh, David. I, I wanted to talk to you to get a perspective on uh, what is what is COVID nineteen. What is the pandemic revealed about racism? Uh, both continentally, internationally, but, but in particular for Canada, which has a long tradition of aspiring to or presenting itself as liberal and um, not racist, uh, multicultural, as they like to call it. What, what do you feel COVID has revealed? Well, so, so that's a big question. I think um, it's revealed a lot and it's, you know, it's one of those things in which, you know, because it's COVID has touched everybody, essentially everybody around the world. You know, you know it's, it, it both, it's both political, economic, and personal. And I think there are different ways we can respond to the question. Like probably the response to that question prior to George Floyd would have been quite different, or at least slightly different um, compared to the, the post uh, George Floyd murder in terms of what it's revealed, at least, or, or at the very least, George Floyd sort of accentuated some of the things that were already making appearance in terms of, of what the coronavirus was revealing about Canadian society, North American society, and internationally. So, you know, you mentioned Canada, you know, Canada's being part of North America, but of course there's always, always this, this, this idea of, um, you know, kind of Canadian exceptionalism, a kind of Canadian Canadian exceptionalism of some kind. And this idea that, and most people, I think, in most parts of the world, have this perception of Canada as a kind of liberal state, in which the kinds of problems that we associate with the United States, especially the United States, because we share a border with the United States, um, don't exist in, in in this society. Of course, it's a long-standing myth like the myth of canadian innocence and you know of course people who think about these questions and write about these questions or experience this phenomena of course know very well that, that that the myth is just that it's a myth but i think what has been revealing um or what has been accentuated in terms of people's understanding during the COVID crisis is just how we don't leave we don't we live we far from living in an egalitarian society 
It's true in terms of indigenous peoples. It's true in terms of people who are racialized in general. In general, it's true in terms of class. And I think it's important to think about those things, race and class, especially alongside each other. So, you know, I live here in Montreal, and one of the things that became quite apparent, and you know, we were hearing these numbers in the United States, and of course, because of um, you know, I have family connections in, in the UK. We were hearing similar phenomena in the UK um, that various groups were being disproportionately impacted by COVID, um, that there were certain neighborhoods where the rates of infection were much higher than in other neighborhoods. Um, and, and here in Montreal, um, that meant neighborhoods where there were large numbers of people of African descent uh, large numbers of people who are racialized, large numbers of people who uh, have immigrant backgrounds, right? Whether they were born here or, or, or not. And of course, you know, when the media begins to talk about, talk about a virus, right? So we talk about infection, uh, you know, in racial terms, it can be very dangerous and, 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 and tricky because it often leads to forms of pathologization in which the very people who are victims of a virus becomes victim of how they are depicted as if they themselves are the virus. And of course that happens when there's no adequate or any context provided in terms of why is it that there are particular neighborhoods that have been disproportionately affected by the COVID crisis. And of course that has to, to do with social economic standing. Uh, in, the, in the case of Montreal, there's been a dramatic shift over the last 10, 15, 20 years where it's gone from being one of the most affordable cities in North America um, uh, to a city in which you know, the cost of housing, uh, rent, et cetera, has gone up quite dramatically mm -hmm. right? and, and out of sync in terms of people's, um, um, in terms of what people earn. So what we find is there was a time not that long ago, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when um, rent was very affordable, people could afford to you know, adequately live in a, you know, adequately support their families in a, an apartment with sufficient space. And now we have overcrowding, right? And when you, when you, and when you, when you add overcrowding to groups of people, populations, racialized people who have been, you know, disproportionately unemployed um, or, or underemployed and find themselves in situations of overpopulated housing, uh, many women and men, actually, women and men who work as caregivers in various capacities from nurses to nurses' aides, et cetera. Um, of course, those groups of people are going to be disproportionately impacted. Um, poor people in general have been disproportionately impacted. And of course, because people of African descent, in this case, they're, dis they're disproportionately below the poverty line in this province, right? It, makes sense that you would find that they are disproportionately impacted by the crisis too. So basically what, you know, that's a long way of saying that um, the inequalities, the inherent inequalities that exist in Canadian society and in Quebec society um, have uh, sort of been, not that those inequalities have been accentuated, but, you know, our appreciation or understanding of the, of the existence of, the, of those inequalities have, have been accentuated by, by the crisis. So, so, we, so it's revealing, I, I've, for, the, for those who watch this program often, I repeat myself by saying, you know, it's not the underlying health problems that are a problem, it's the underlying wealth problems that are Absolutely. making our people more vulnerable. Um, Absolutely. And, and and it just seems to me, I wonder, you know, to what extent, given that there have been um, mobilizations in, in Montreal, in Toronto, uh, in Vancouver, here in, in Ottawa, uh, in response to the outrageous torture and killing of George Floyd, and then subsequently of others uh, in the US, uh, and uh, drawing attention to the killing of, of Black people here in in Canada, to, to what extent do you think these these sort of mobilizations uh, will enable some sort of organized response to the marginalization, the impoverishment of uh, 
of people, uh, black people, poor people, and so on uh, in in Canada. Well, that's that's an interesting question because I think part of your answer to the question is in is also embedded in the question. And so far as uh, you know, we witnessed an unprecedented an unprecedented wave of protests, at least unprecedented in terms of my lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't alive in the 60s and there are, you know, people around that might make those kind of parallels. And from a historical perspective, I would make those parallels too. But um, to see this overflow and touching so many levels, I mean, you know, if you're, if you watch sports or sports commentators, you'll know that, you know, these conversations about race have been playing themselves out on all those kind of sports, sports, sports shows. Um, and in sports itself, you know, you see athletes in England in the Premier League wearing Black Lives Matter on their shirts and big banners of Black Lives Matter in the stadium, in stadiums. So, um, so it's this, it's been this groundswell that has touched all parts, many parts of the world, so many parts of the world, across Europe, you know, Asia. I mean, there's nobody that has not been touched by this because people watched um, uh, an absolutely senseless, unjustified killing, murder, and, and lynching is a word that people have been, been using, play itself out, and, you know, um, through, through, through the media. I mean, so it's unprecedented in that sense, but it's, it's taken in the form of protest, which is, you know, and, and again, to go back to what we were talking about before, the combination of COVID, George Floyd, but also Donald Trump, right? And the antics of Donald Trump, Donald Trump have opened up this space for conversation. And I can't think of another time, you know, in my almost 50 years, where I've heard, I've heard witnessed on a grand scale, playing itself out also through the mass media, uh, conversations about race dynamics, conversations about white privilege, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, conversations that used to play themselves out more in intellectual circles, academic circles, right? Some of that language is now being appropriated through the media. And you have, if you listen to some of the call-in shows, people are making reference to their privilege and they said, yeah. So all of that's been really interesting. And of course, on a level of self-organization, this mass process has been um, really impressive in terms of putting certain questions on the agenda. But then part of your question asks about, you use the word organization, and, and, and it kind of raises the question of what are we organizing for, mm -hmm. right? So what does organization really mean and, and to what end? Yeah. And that's where it gets a bit complicated and tricky, I think, because, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Black Lives Matter movement as a generic movement. But of course, it's comprised of a range of people with a range of perspectives and opinions and, um, and even to a certain extent, goals and objectives, right? And if we broaden beyond Black Lives Matter to think about the various kind of traditions in, in Black thought and politics, we could maybe broadly draw two categories. One in which there's a level of protest and organization that is tied to having a seat at the table. In other words, it's kind of more reformist. Its perspective is more tied to thinking about, well, how can we find, or, or how can we find more black people, place more people of African descent in positions of power and authority as a way to affect change, right? And then there's, the more, there's the other tradition, which we might loosely refer to as the black radical tradition, right? Which recognizes that there are inherent flaws in the system itself and it's the system itself that needs to be changed right and i think it's fair to say that that dynamic has played itself out in many circles in terms of black lives matter right and that these conversations you know i'm saying black lives matter but i think we have to be careful when just talk about we're talking about black political conversation and mobilization in general and not all of it necessarily uh, under the banner of, of BLM. But, you know, it raises this question of like, what is it that we are fighting for, right? And, and, and you know, when I think about this question, there, there are a couple of people that come to mind, Claudia Jones, C.L.R. James, Walter Rodney, among others, who were always clear in terms of perspective about the fact that we need to think about race alongside class, right? And that if we think about race a long time, 
alongside class. Inherent in those dynamics is a critique of capitalism, right? And uh, you know the kinds of inequalities that we're referring to when we're talking about housing, we're talking about unemployment, access to education, et cetera, et cetera. And we can extend that to the prison industrial complex, complex and, and rates of incarceration, the disproportionate rates of incarceration of people of African descent, but also indigenous peoples in the states, also Latinos, right? Um, all of that are part of a systemic problem or a, sy or a system, right? Where institutional forms of exclusion play themselves out that disproportionately, disproportionately uh, impact people. And I don't want to just broadly use the terms racialized people because it affects racialized people in different ways. So disproportionately, impacts the lives of people of African descent in this context, indigenous peoples and the poor. And when black folks are also disproportionately poor, clearly it disproportionately impacts the lives of poor black folks in that sense too, right? So whereas, you know, there's a lot of conversation about Black Lives Matter in a very broad sense, as I was saying earlier, I think we need to look at the kinds of questions that are being posed by different groups and how different groups are thinking about how we organize for change in ways that radically transform the system that reproduces these forms of inequality, as opposed to another tradition that sees itself as part of the system and searching for more inclusion into the system, a redistribution of power at the top, but in ways that still facilitate the forms of the very forms of exploitation and oppression that presumably we're fighting against. So, um, yeah, I guess it's a, a way of, of being cautious about how we sometimes talk about, you know, black politics and black movements in the single or in the plural sense in this case as being uniform and homogeneous. When, um, you know, there there are nuances. There are nuances to the conversations that are being that are happening right now. I think one thing that we can say though, is that a window opened uh, a few weeks back in the aftermath of George Floyd. And you know, the, the, the level of conversation may be, may be unprecedented in terms of thinking about racial dynamics. But then it raises a question again of like, so what's the objective of those conversations in terms of what we mean by social transformation? Are we talking about the kind of change that that, 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 that negates the forms of, the forms of inequalities that we, that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis that affect some groups more than others, but largely affect the poor and the dispossessed and disproportionately among those people of African descent, um, Blacks and Latinos in the North American context and, in, and, and, people, and Indigenous peoples among others. Or, or are we uh, talking again about having a seat at the same table that's responsible for all these inequalities in the first place? So, but do you see any signs of a move of greater democratization, a greater, more collective organizing? Uh, because it must start there. It, it's it's uh, the definition of where we want to go, surely, is a product of the kind of conversations that can be held in democratic spaces. Do you, do you see that happening at all? Of course, because I think, you know, the, converse, the conversations themselves are part of that kind of you know democratic process that you're referring to in the best sense of that word um and you know you know with any kind of movement or any kind of you know politics i mean in terms of thinking about change you know having some kind of vision or perspective of what that society or what that kind of change should look like not just what we want but how we imagine getting there, I think is important. And that's, you know, and that's, I think a, an important point of departure in terms of thinking about how conversations become tied to concrete actions. Um, you know, I'm saying that at, at this stage, there have been many kinds of conversations, um, but, you know, in some respects, those conversations are not new. Um, I guess kind of what I'm saying too is that like, some of those conversations perhaps perhaps could be more, I mean, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, we need to talk more about exactly the kind of society that we want to live in, right? And that's the basis or the foundation for talking about 
how we arrive at building that kind of society or how we, and I think this is the important question, how we organize to bring about the kind of change that is necessary to bring that kind of society into being. I think right now in the US context, a big part of that conversation is tied to the, the upcoming election, right? So then we have a conversation in terms of, I'm not saying this is like the sum total of those conversations, but the, the, a big part of how that conversation is playing itself out in the mass media is in terms, is about getting rid of Trump, right? And of course the alternative to Trump is, is Joe Biden. But then in terms of the kind of change that we're talking about long-term and keeping in mind that what's ha what happens in the United States affects people all over the world and, 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 and absolutely affects our lives here in Canada because we share a border in terms of trade, in terms of like the whole kind of cultural political influence. Um, you know, we're in a difficult moment in which politics in some circles, and of course, because, you know, there's a madness that's been happening in the White House over the last four years, of course, it's a natural conversation. But the concern is that politics is being sort of reduced to these two very limited alternatives between Trump and Biden within the framework of the same political economic system that has reproduced the kinds of, the re, that reproduces the kind of society that, that leads to the acts of violence against people of George Floyd or many people in the Canadian context too, or again in the Canadian and in the overall North American context, the ways in which people of African descent are disproportionately incarcerated. So, and these questions are being raised. I don't want to, you know, um, these questions are being raised. I, I think about some of the, you know, could we imagine five weeks ago, six weeks ago, before the murder of George Floyd, that uh, a conversation about defunding the police or thinking about a state beyond police would have been possible. And the, and the answer is absolutely not. I mean, the people, you know, folks who have been talking about these questions in terms of the prison industrial complex and policing for years, all of a sudden were given a, you know, because of the space that opened up in terms of the protest, uh, were given a platform I'm thinking about a, 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 an article that my very good friend, for example, Mariam Kaba in New York wrote that was published in the New York Times very recently on defunding the police, right? I mean, it's unprecedented in that sense. But in a way, for us, that window, which was open just a few weeks ago, has already closed in some respects. I mean, the conversations are ongoing, but they're not playing themselves out in the same public way, and particularly in terms of the mass media, in the way that they would be before, they were before. So the big question becomes then outside of the spotlight of the mass media, which, you know, for at least two weeks straight, maybe three, was covering the BLM movement, the protests, and, and basically anything that black folks had to say in relation to race. Now that, that conversation has sort of been pushed to the side and that news cycle has gone, you know, how do we continue that conversation about how we organize for change um, beyond protest, which is profoundly important in terms of highlighting forms of just injustice and inequality, and outside of the spotlight of the media, which has gone through that cycle. And I imagine we won't see the likes of that kind of, that level of coverage about um, race, uh, et cetera, anytime soon. Do you, do you think so? I mean, I, I'm surprised at the number of Articles I've seen in in magazines like Newsweek and Time uh, mm -hmm. magazine, mm -hmm. which are not known for their <laughs> particularly mm -hmm. aggressive stance, um, opening mm -hmm. up uh, conversations even this week uh, um, around around that. And I'm just trying to imagine what impact is that having on Canada? I mean, is is do you when you know this uh, defunding the police, the incarceration movement, etc., is very much. I think in the forefront in the discussions in in the U.S. What about this side of the border? Well, it's been it's been pretty much the same conversation, um, and you know, I think you know we we don't just share a border. Like right? there's this kind of generic thing that we can call a North American culture, like right? where there are these there are these, of course there clearly there are certain specificities in terms of the institutions in Canada, political, social versus those that exist in the United States on a federal, provincial, state, city level, et cetera. There are, there are, of course, there are differences, but you know, you know, that border has historically been quite porous, you know, 
We all, as people living in Canada, have family who live in the United States. My sister lives in the United States, for example. You know, we visit, we you know, visited family as you know, going back and forth, that, forth across that border. So, you know, this is really a North American phenomenon that was sparked by uh, an incident that occurred in the United States, which has then served to highlight injustices that have occurred in the Canadian context. So. You know, as somebody that, you know, tries to follow the news a little bit in terms of what's happening both in Canada and the United States, you know, the conversations have been very similar, you know. Um, the demands have been quite similar. And as I was saying before, whether it's on NPR in the US or on CBC, I cannot remember another time where I've heard those kinds of conversations consistently play themselves out from one day to the next. Now, of course, there are, you know, permutations to all of that. So living in Quebec, for example, and living in Montreal, um, and I kind of have to be careful about how I say this because I, I know, you know, th th there are some differences from one province to the next, I'll put it that way. And Quebec is very particular and Montreal is very particular because what we have in the we have a situation in Quebec in which Montreal is a cosmopolitan city of you know, people from all over the world in terms of their cultural origins, um, multiple languages, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a cosmopolitan city, right? But it's not Quebec, it's not the province of Quebec. So in terms of the state structure and politics, you know, there's been a great deal of resistance. And I would say on a certain level, more resistance of a certain kind, of a particular kind, to thinking about forms of systemic racism in the Canadian, in the Quebec context. And in part because uh, of the, it's because of the peculiar history of this province in which um, we have in power, especially since the 1960s and the Quiet Revolution, a French majority, a French Quebecois majority in Quebec um, that, own, that, 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 that has state power, but still understands itself as a minority as an oppressed minority, that's important, within the context of Canada. And for that reason, even though we have the same kind of dynamics in terms of race politics across this country and forms of racial exclusion, the language or discourse around it in the Quebec context is somewhat different. And there's an, a layer of resistance. And I don't mean, when I say that, I don't mean more or less resistance, but a different layer of resistance to certain kind of change, because in order to you know, to acknowledge that change means to acknowledge that this oppressed minority as it understands itself historically in the Canadian context is also oppressor. And no group that understands itself as being oppressed likes to understand itself as being an oppressor, right? So there's a strong resistance to the language of systemic racism in the Canadian context. I mean, in the Quebec context that, um, you know, that, that, that particular layer, I don't think has played itself out in the same way in, in the rest of Canada. But, and you know, um, in fact, many Quebecers will tell you that, look, you know, we're oppressed and have historically been oppressed just like you. But of course, you know, that language of oppression, even though it's historically true in terms of French Canadians in relation to English Canada, in terms of what New France was, it was colonized, that is true, right? And it's also true that before the Quiet Revolution, the circumstances under which French Quebecers lived compared to English Quebecers was, was disproportionately negative. That's absolutely true. Uh, but, you know, that narrative completely negates the history of slavery in this province, for example, right? At whatever scale it existed, which included the enslavement, of course, the colonization of indigenous peoples, right? So that narrative only works to a certain extent. It works at the it, it, it works at the expense of those groups in the Quebec context that, that have been excluded. So there's a, there's a particular nuance to the conversation in this province, which I think in terms of thinking about the dynamics of race, class, and colonization, Quebec is a really interesting place to kind of think about those questions on a global scale or interesting, you know, quote, quote unquote, case study for lack of a better word, because, you know, the nuances of how those conversations play themselves out in this province are different because of those historical reasons. I mean, you, you point this out in, in uh, Fear of the Black Nation about what do they call themselves there? 
Le Negro Blanc. Le Negro Blanc, oui. Uh, and and um, so they saw themselves as oppressed in relation to the British control of uh, of Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, but I I was always surprised the extent to which, uh, when I was living in Montreal, how much uh, uh, people did not accept or had a silence around their role as oppressors, their role as colonizers, their role as settlers, um, that, that because they were oppressed by the British, the, the, uh, the, French, the Francophone are therefore the oppressed and, and there's no uh, parallel with, with uh, settlership. Is that of still course. happening? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, in many ways, that's what I'm describing, you know, because, you know, to think about French Quebecers as colonizers, as settlers, it destroys a national narrative, or at least, well, maybe destroys is a harsh word. It changes the national narrative, right? Because there's no law that says that people who are oppressed can't be oppressors too, right? And it's that part of that conversation, the fact that uh, French Quebecers colonize what became New France, colonize indigenous peoples, you know, their beings colonize their territory, that slavery existed in what was New France at the time, right? That narrative complicates the story of French Quebecois oppression because, you know, how does one form of oppression take precedence over other forms of oppression in that context, right? And, you know, how do you ignore or negate the experiences of in indigenous peoples, right? There's no, there's no justice in that conversation as far, it, it, there's no justice in, in that, in other words. So that conversation basically gets eclipsed, right? It's eclipsed in terms of what is taught inside classrooms. It's, in, it's eclipsed in terms of um, even folks who see themselves as members of the left, you know, they get very sensitive when these kinds of questions are raised. Again, because no a group that perceives itself or understands itself as being oppressed likes to understand itself as being uh, uh, an oppressor too. Yeah, uh, you, you, you mentioned earlier on uh, that this is an unprecedented period, these conversations mm -hmm. happening. Um, but I mean, I, I recall that, you know, in and you, which you wrote about in, in, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, both in Europe and here uh, across uh, um, North America, there was a real uprising, a real organizing. There were conversations of all kinds and, and organizing of all kinds, some really quite unprecedented uh, forms of alternative, in a sense, state power that the Black Panthers, for example, organized. They always presented sure. as, as military, but they, but they were real organized, community organizers. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 so then then you you had I mean, here in 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 Montreal uh, you you had uh, people like C.L.R. James, Stokely Carmichael, Maria Makeba, Rocky Jones, Walter Rodney. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to have happened, uh, and indeed the occupation of uh, um, Sir George Williams. Sir George, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is this is this a period where? It is possible to bring together internationally, uh, or from the from the global south, these intellectuals once again uh, to to begin formulating those kind of ideas and and possibilities. I think you know we're in the moment, so it's difficult. So you know when I say that this time is unprecedented, I think it's unprecedented for for in my lifetime. I'm almost 50, and it's an, I think it's unprecedented for my generation. But when we look back to the 60s and 70s, late 50s, you know, we're talking about a groundswell of movements, anti-colonial movements in Africa, the Caribbean, around the world. You know, it just, I mean, the, the entire post-Second World War period up in, you know, into, in, into the 1960s, right? Which was unprecedented for that moment and, and, and maybe in some respects went beyond what we're experiencing now. It's hard to, you know, it's often, I think it's, you know, and that's why history is important because history is retrospective. It's kind of hard to, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking at? It's hard to assess the moment that we're in right now because we're in it. And even a year from now, it might look a little bit different, right? Um, 
you know, I do think though that when certain doors are open, it becomes very difficult to close them. So there are conversations that are taking place in various institutions around this country, various companies, various organizations, places like places ordinary. You know, we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about the basic everyday institutions where these conversations have been playing themselves out on a daily basis, where bosses are being challenged in terms of their, you know, how they engage racialized people, how, you know, who's in the boardrooms, who's employed, who's in that, all those questions are being raised. And I think in a way that is unprecedented for my generation and the generation that has come after me, right? I was born in 1970. So that, that I think is absolutely fair, but I think it's too early to assess where these conversations will take us. I think that, you know, the window that opened a few weeks back has closed in some ways, but that doesn't mean that it forecloses those conversations. It just means that the level of public discourse around race that opened up, you know, three or four weeks ago, right? That's not happening right now. But the important question is like, you know, and I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, myself but it's like, you know, what do we do with the space that, the, you know, that the ideas that emerge in that space, you know? Where does that conversation, where those conversations take us in terms of how we think about the kind of society that we, we want to live in? And again, for me, you know, you know, I know it sounds like a bit sort of, you know, black and white, but there are basically essentially two ways that these conversations have been playing themselves out, you know? Again, are we talking about a seat at the table, which is what some people are asking for, which is in many respects, you know, in terms of dealing with the day-to-day -day forms of inequality that most people, that people of, people of color experience or people of African descent experience, of course it's significant. Yeah? But can we have that conversation within the context of talking about how we need to dramatically change our existence in the society in terms of politics and what passes for politics where there's absolutely no active participation of ordinary citizens? in terms of how we think about our relationship to the natural environment, like, you know? You know, we're in the middle of this COVID crisis, which of course has eclipsed this, this, this other crisis, which maybe you could say, you could make an argument that's connected to it, in other words, too, uh, which is, uh, the, you know, the, the global environmental crisis. And as, you know, as we speak, you know, indigenous peoples in the Amazon, Amazon rainforest in Brazil, you know, are being forcibly removed and some are even saying there are acts of genocide being engaged against those people, right? So where, you know, where, you know, we, and so just so we need to have a combination, a conversation that connects those dots in terms of the politics and economics and in terms of environment and, and in terms of what you said, because you, you talked about the 1960s being a moment of internationalism. You know, there's a way in which sometimes these conversations can play themselves out that they become national conversations. And there's a kind of lingering or, or very um, explicit form of nationalism that talks about change within the confines of certain boundaries, but doesn't, doesn't understand or appreciate that to the extent that certain people are privileged in North American society, those privileges are, are, are built upon the inherent forms of inequality that exist between North America or Europe and the, the so-called global south. So um, it's not to say that these conversations are not happening. I'm just kind of saying that, and, and in fact, I know that they are, you know, and, and as I said, my understanding of Black Lives Matter is that it's a complicated organization with or a, 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 com a complicated umbrella, not organization, sorry, or movement in which, you know, there are various groups that place more emphasis on some of these questions than, than others, right? And I'm suggesting that it's really important in our moment to be able to connect the dots in ways that allow us to kind of appreciate the way that race, class, like internationalism, international capitalism, I'm going to name it, impinges, of life, impinges upon the lives of people around the world and how we are interconnected, that our fate, our fates are tied, our fates in North America, since this is where we are, our fates in Canada, are tied to the fates of people in other parts of the world. And that people are posing the same kinds of questions in different ways, and it's for us to make those kinds of connections. 
Yeah, uh, I, I wonder whether you you might say a few words about what led you to 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 address this issue, which was really a, a, something that arose in 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 Britain or more particularly in England, uh, and that's the, the 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 dread poetry and freedom of Linton Quesi Johnson. What led mm -hmm. you to 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 address this, and what was the what, what it is an extraordinarily rich collection of material uh, and an analysis uh, and the breadth, I am amazed at your breadth of knowledge of, of poetry itself, not just of, uh, of uh, Linton Quesi Johnson. What, what were you trying to, to get across in that, in terms, in particular, the unfinished uh, revolution? Mm -hmm. Well, well, thanks for that question, Feroz, because, you know, there's a way that we could easily talk about what we just spoke about and then speak about poetry as two separate conversations. And what I tried to do in Dread Poetry and Freedom was bring those conversations together. Um, you know, I'm somebody, I grew up on poetry, may not, you know, and I say poetry in the most expansive sense of that word because, I mean, for me, growing up listening to reggae music, and listening to the poetry, the lyricism of Bob Marley and many of the reggae artists and DJs, that for me was poetry, even if I did not recognize it at the time. Curtis Mayfield for me, you know, the great um, soul R&B singer and composer, that's poetry. You know, he's a poet to me too. Um, so it's a way of saying that I think poetry has always been part of my consciousness. And, and then when I discovered Lyndon Crazy Johnson's poetry in the late 90s, it was actually quite late because I, I was you know, aware of other poets that sort of speak and write within the same genre of poetry as Linton Quaid Johnson, so-called dub poetry. But for some reason, I had never encountered him. It was a very good friend, Richard Eiton, that introduced me to him. And when I first heard his poetry, it just completely blew me away. I had never heard anything like it. You know, it's kind of sonorous, wet, melancholy, wailing voice and the accompanying music, um, it just, it just, you know, I just felt, trans, you know, I felt transposed in many ways. But it's the lyricism and the po politics tied to his lyricism that ultimately grabbed me. And seeing the impact and influence of people like Franz Fanon, or reading and 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 identifying the influence of people like Amy Cazier and Franz Fanon, um, who are both, of course, connected in terms of being from Martinique, and at one point Fanon being Cazier's student. Um, but not two folks you would necessarily identify with a particular poet, but you know, his early poetry on, poet, poetry on fratricide and police violence, which was very much influenced by Césaire, what I refer to as Césaire, Césaire realism, kind of formal surrealism that was unique and his own, and the phenomenology of Franz Fanon, or phenomenology. Um, you know, this kind of sense of movement and change and possibilities um, that's very kind of it'd be kind of both visceral and very experiential. So I was really grabbed by his music, well, the musicality of his poetry and also the music that accompanied his poetry. And, um, you know, when I had some time between 2001 and 2002, I had just come back from the World Conference Against Racism in Durban and, you know, with a group of younger people, we had toured. Uh, uh, several cities in South Africa over almost a month period, about three and a half weeks. And I came back, I had some time between, let's say September 2001 and more or less uh, May 2002, when my daughter was born, anticipating that my daughter was gonna be born. And, you know, having just left a job as a, a community worker in which we were trying to bring into practice some of the things that, you know, you know, we kind of theorize and think about in terms of the community building, working with younger people, et cetera, et cetera. And having really struggled to realize some of the, 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 the objectives that we uh, you know, set out to, to meet, even with some successes and ultimately seeing some things sort of crash and fall apart in some ways. It kind of led me into this with a bit of a, let's call it an existential crisis for lack of a better word, but it was both personal and political. And it forced me to kind of think about the very question that we're talking about today in many respects. What is it that social change means, right? You know, what is this thing about? How do we think about organizing for change? And 
while I don't have the answers to those questions, I try and spark a conversation about those questions in the book. And it's interesting, what is interesting though is that those questions and my responses in a certain kind of way to those questions came about through, by writing through the work of a poet and ultimately concluding that among other things, if we want to really think about and work towards changing this world that we live in, the understanding being that there's a great deal in this world that needs to be dramatically, radically changed, that we need to break away from kind of conventional ways of thinking about politics, you know, conventional, conventional ways of doing politics or organizing around politics, in order to, to think about, well, what does that mean? Or what would that look like? I suggest that a point of departure is that we need to try and tap into the same kind of creativity that artists tap into in their creative endeavors. In other, way, in other words, artists are not restricted by, and poets in particular, I, I refer to, of course, uh, are not restricted by the same boundaries and rules, right? Or limitations that somebody who may also write, but they write prose, or maybe they be an intellectual in a particular discipline and they're tied to a particular methodology, which when you apply, apply in terms of politics, always brings us to the kind of conventional boundaries and limitation. You know, so we need to tap into that kind of artist creativity. And one of the people that, as you know, um, I have a great deal of admiration for, um, you know, even as like, we can always, you know, you know, some hagiography, like we, we can always raise critical questions and we should always raise, raise critical questions about any thinker. But when I think about, you know, my life as a young adult into, you know, teenager into adulthood, the one person who I've been consistently reading, going back to and engaging is C.L.R. James. And it's no coincidence that C.L.R. James was what uh, Paul Buell has referred to as an artist, as revolutionary. In other words, he attempted to apply creatively, creati creatively his sensibilities as an artist to politics. So even though he might fit the label, you know, very much influenced by Marxism to the point where he could be called a Marxist and would identify himself as a Marxist, you know, whatever category, right? He was also, he was always bending the rules of those categories, right? And making those categories his own or creating new categories of thinking, right? As a way of thinking about how we imagine and create a vision of the world that we would like to see. And I know that can sound a bit, you know, I mean, it could probably sound a little bit out there, but I think what I'm clear about or what has become clear to me over time is that I, without a kind of vision of where we want to go, a clear vision of what kind of society we want to live in, we can't, begin, we can't really begin to talk about how we bring that society into being. So, you know, you know and it brings us back to the conversation we we're having before, but like, so any kind of political conversation is important and having a space to have that conversation is important. But it requires creativity and imagination and, you know, thinking in order to do, and the doing that we do influences how we think and imagine. So it's this creative dynamic process that unfolds over time. And um, sometimes we have to step back and engage in serious reflection. And, you know, that is work, oh, that's serious work, actually. It's important work, you know, and it's practical work, too, you know, because otherwise we get stuck into the day-to-day -day of politics, which is part of this machinery, right? And before we know it, we're wrapped up in the same systems that we're trying to transform. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just wonder whether um, I shouldn't uh, just make sure people know that uh, uh, your book, Dread Poetry and Freedom, has, was published by Between the Lines. Um, and I strongly encourage anyone watching this program uh, to get hold of a copy. It's available in both uh, uh, soft cover and as an uh, EPUB. Um, Just to clarify, so so the Canadian publisher is between the lines, and in internationally, including in the UK, it's, it's Pluto Press. Oh, it's Pluto Press in the UK, and then okay, and internationally. Mm -hmm. um, but very strongly encourage people to to have a look at this very very rich uh, rich text. 
Um, I, I, I was curious that um, Linton Cressy Johnson just won the, uh, the, the Penn Printer Prize. That's for great. Freedom of expression, which I thought, well, uh, uh, I suppose it's the freedom to express in the way that he did, or was it a freedom of expression in the conventional way? Mm. Yeah, that's it. That was it. I mean, you know, yeah, I don't know much about the prize itself, but what I what I can say is that, you know, Linton Quayley Johnson had an interesting stage in his life. You know, he's been doing what he does for a long time. He hasn't produced a lot of poetry recently, um, you know, but his poetry, and the mark of a great poet, that his poetry still stands. And his poetry, his poetry still speaks to the time in which we're living. So when I listen to Sonny's letter in 2020, you know, which is a, a, a poem written in the form of a letter uh, about uh, a young man writing behind prison, you know, writing from the, behind the, 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 the prison bars of Brixton Prison um, because of an altercation with a police officer in which an officer loses his life. You know, I still get goosebumps sometimes listening to that poem. And it still resonates in terms of thinking about the experiences of people, you know, uh, of black folks, in the UK, Canada, North America, et cetera, today. When I think about his poetry, his early poetry on police violence, on fratricide, that invokes Cesare and Fanon, or his, you know, his later poems in the 90s that captured the experience of the rise, of the demise of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, yet, yet, yet still holds on to the belief that some conception of socialism is still possible. In fact, even more possible in the aftermath of those, the, the collapse of those moribund states. Um, you know, when I think about him as a poet and the, the, the kind of the longevity of his poetry, you know, I'm not sure what freedom of expression, expression quite means in that sense, but I think that his poetry stands, still stands the test of time. And, he's, and, he's, and, and if freedom of expression means being a voice for freedom, he has absolutely been that kind of poet. You know, he once referred to the great poet from Guyana, Martin Carter, as the political poet par excellence. And I think it's the kind of um, title that, that, that his poetry, that he as a poet, well deserves too. Um, you know, there, 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 are, there are several generations that have been, you know, that have been groomed on his poetry. And his poetry has taken him and his work around the world you know, you go to South Africa, you go to parts of Europe, Germany, Italy, you know, well beyond the UK and, and France, you know, his poetry still speaks, and interestingly, across languages. And obviously in the Caribbean too, it still speaks to, you know, these questions of social justice, you know, you know, fighting against forms of inequality and ultimately bringing out the new society that we, you know, that we all hopefully, you know, if we're on quote unquote, the right side of history, we open, open wish for, you know. He's been receiving a number of awards over the last couple of years. And I think it's part of what happens when people begin to recognize your work. Um, early 2000s, he was, um, his poetry was published in the Penguin Modern Classics edition, uh, Cla Penguin Modern Classics edition, uh, which is- um, The only living poet who is, they've published. Exactly, he was the only living poet at the time, that, the only living poet that was published in that series, right? So that was considered, a big deal, especially for somebody who considered himself a poet of the underground. Now that was true at the beginning for sure, but of course, once he started putting his poetry to music, first with Virgin Records, which you know he helped become a big record label, but then later with the same Island Records, the same label as Bob Marley, right? He was no longer simply an underground, an underground poet, but was a poet whose poetry, you know, recorded was reaching hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people around around the world. So, you know, he's seen that kind of arc and he, you know, I guess at this time of this moment in his life, um, people are beginning to reflect on the importance of his poetry and his work and, you know, who knows what other kind of um, accolades will come his way. He, you know, he may have an interesting choice to make politically if the, 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 the British monarchy approaches him with those, you know, those various um, titles, right? <laughs> others have, you know, others have absolutely rejected them, right? It'd be interesting to see what, if that happens, yeah. um, if, they haven't, if they haven't quietly approached him before, 
um, how that plays itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, uh, you, 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 you use the title or subtitle uh, and the unfinished revolution. And every time I have a conversation with you, David, I feel that there's an unfinished conversation. We could be talking mm -hmm. all day, and I don't think I would get enough uh, uh, from all the all the thinking that you you do. I just want to say thank you, David, for for having given us so much of your time today, uh, and a, and a really insightful and interesting conversation. I appreciate that. Um, no, my absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure, for us, always, yeah, absolutely. Great. And you know, we we need to have more of these conversations, right? It's about it's about our very existence, actually. You know, it's about where we are in the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so let's uh, keep that promise and say this is an unfinished conversation, and uh, absolutely, just to be continued. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, David. Uh, I look forward to being in touch again soon. Take care. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for for joining us today with this conversation with David Austin. Um, this, is, uh, this is Firoz Manji uh, signing off for today. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us here on Organizing in the Time of COVID. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.